مرحبا بكم اليوم في حلقة جديدة من Iro Talks. Good morning, good evening, everybody. Welcome to a new episode from the Iro Talks, fully organized by Rocket Rib Leader Team. In today's episode, we'll be talking about Mars with a special guest. He's an Algerian scientist, worked with two major mission with NASA, Curiosity and Perseverance. Perseverance actually will be launched in the in the coming days. Just uh, in in the coming days, yeah. Uh, talking about any yeah, Mars launching uh, mission, I would like to, on behalf of, of uh, Rocket Rib Leader team, I would like to uh, to, to send my uh, my happy wishes to uh, uh, all the Emirates team that uh, been part of uh, the Hope mission to Mars uh, after the successful launch yesterday. So, without any further ado, uh, I would like to pass the everything to Mr. The Professor Malikshi to to present himself as, as well and uh, start the presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. I also would like to add my congratulations to the UAE team uh, that had a successful launch yesterday. I had the chance to visit in Dubai with them a few two years ago, a few years ago. And um, I was impressed with the work they were doing and I wish them continued success because they are actually setting up, I think, a, uh, something that would inspire generations of young people from the region to be interested in science and technology and they're showing what's possible. So congratulations to them and um, I'm very, very happy that they've had a, a really successful launch. Yeah. So I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, this is the first part of a two-part um, presentation on what some of the things we're doing on Mars. I would like to say that when um, Mohammed and Mohammed when, and Faris asked me to join them, I was of course very, very happy. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't quite sure what to talk about. Uh, I, I just wasn't sure what to talk about. So I have selected a few things. I, I don't know if it's too simple, if it's too complex, but uh, I, it's a range of things. But any of the things I'm going to talk about, if anybody wants to dig deeper into any of these, I'll be happy to, to talk to those people or to come back some other time. Uh, so, uh, just to be sure, we know, so today I really have to leave at 4. I have another meeting I came from and I said I'll be back at 4.05. Uh, but uh, in the second part of this talk, which would be on Wednesday, I'm happy to stay longer if need be. Uh, so, having said that, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, could you share your screen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. So sharing the screen. So there we go. Yeah. yeah. Good. You, sh you should see it, right? Yeah. Good. Everything good. Okay. Perfect. So um, I would like to start by saying again, thank you for doing this. Uh, can you share this? Can, can you see the screen, or should I put it completely on the full page? Is it good uh, enough? Yeah. Good enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm. Um, um, I just want to say that this is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing that you're doing together. And it, uh, it, it says um, a lot of things about the students in Algeria and in Bidan, particularly in this case. Uh, so the, the talk I'm going to give you today, I would like to say that it is um, essentially dedicated to the professionals, the medical professionals who are fighting COVID all over the world, and in particular, those who are fighting it in Algeria. I know it's really hard. They've been working really, really hard to keep all of us safe, and they've been working under very difficult conditions. So this talk is for them. Uh, so I'll start. So as you said, my name is Nur Dimirikshi. I'm, I'm a member of uh, uh, NASA Mars missions. The first one is Curiosity. The second one is the one that's going to be launched soon, Perseverance. And in, and in particular, I'm actually, I'll talk more about which instrument I'm, I'm working on. So I'll talk about that. So let me just move to give you an outline of the talk. So first, I would like to describe to you a little bit of the NARS, the, the, the NASA Mars mission that went in 2011. And the, 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 the rover that's on, on Mars right now called Curiosity. What is or what, what are its scientific goals? 
because if you want to do something, you need to understand what your goals are, including in science. So what are the scientific goals? What are the questions he's trying to answer? Then we'll talk a little bit about the rover itself, i.e. what type of instruments, what's the rover? How do we put those instruments together to answer the questions that have been asked for the scientific goals? So that's, that's first part. And then I will share with you a few of the results. Of course, I can't share everything, there's so much. But a few of the results that have uh, things that we've learned about Mars, thanks to the rover, and in particular, thanks to one instrument of the rover, the ChemCam instrument, which I'm working on. The, the 10 instruments, I can't talk about everything, so just one instrument focused. And that's the instrument I work on myself. So, And I'll talk a little bit about the next Mars mission, which is going to be launched on September 30th in a few days. And I'll talk about its scientific goals as well. And maybe we can see how the two goals of the, of the, of the curiosity and goals of perseverance, this one is called perseverance, are connected. And then we'll talk also about Perseverance Rover itself. You know, what does it look like? And if in the first part of the talk, I'll talk about the physics, a little bit more physics, the physics of the instrument, or instrument cam cam, how does it really work? What's the concept behind it? In the second part, maybe I'll talk a little bit about, about uh, the data and what, you know, data analysis and so forth that we are doing. So those are, uh, that's more or less the outline. Now, what do we expect from this? You are spending an hour of your life today, another hour of your life maybe on Wednesday. So that's two hours of your life. So what are, what, why are we doing this? So I hope, this is a hope, and uh, we'll try, that after these couple of lectures, you will be able to do the following, and I put them here. You should be able to, or hopefully you will be able to explain the scientific goals of the mission, of the, of the Curiosity mission and of Perseverance mission, both. So what are the scientific goals? And you should be able to explain them, or at least talk to them, uh, on, even if it's a superficial level. Uh, second is you'll be able to explain at least one physics concept that's being used on Mars. And I will describe that and I'll try. I'm not talking about doing the mathematics of it, because we don't have time to do that. I'm talking about just the concept itself. How does it really work? Uh, both, and this, the, the, this concept is both being used uh, for curiosity and being used also for, uh, for perseverance. So it's an important concept to understand. It's also a concept that's being used by the Chinese, they're going to march by the Indians, by the Europeans as well. So it's an important concept to grasp and to understand for space exploration. Then I think is, you know, as you probably know, we collect data. How is that data, you know, turned into information? Who, what's the process by which that data becomes information? And from that information, what's the process by which that information becomes new knowledge? So we talk about that, that process a little bit. Then you should be able to explain or talk about one application from this uh, mission that is being used or will be used on Earth i.e. this is a startup from a colleague of mine who is a member of the team with us and he has created a startup here in the US and I could share with you what he's doing with his of course agreement and then you'll be able to see how big science helps in creating these startups. Uh, this is just one example, it's not the only one of course. Then I will, you should be able to explore further into any aspect of, the, of what I'm presenting. So again, I'm giving you a first level, but you should be able to go further and further by going to papers, by going to, 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 to the literature that's out there. And finally, I hope that you will understand and you'll be able to explain how actually different fields together, whether it's geology, mathematics, physics, chemistry, how all of these things come together to solve a big problem, that none of the fields, nobody can do this, no field by itself can solve the problems that we're gonna talk about. So that's my plan, and that's what I hope you would learn after the two lectures that we have together. Now let me move to um, talk about Mars itself. This is a picture of Mars uh, taken uh, recently, but Mars today, at least on the surface, does not have the characteristics 
of a habitable environment. And yet, you know, if there was some in in history, there is belief, and there is well, we'll get to that to to this later on. And it was actually quite a rich planet in terms of water. It was something, you know, a planet that had um, a rich environment, and all of a sudden, this is not the case. And why? And what happened? And what can we learn from there? So let me move now to uh, the Mars mission Curiosity rover itself. So before I do that, what I would like to show you is, and before I describe the scientific goals, is to remind you the launch that happened in August 2011. And this is a short video, uh, about two, three minutes or less, that actually show you the launch. I think it just gets us a little bit our juices going so we can talk about, about this. So what you have seen there is, is a pre-launch video of what would happen. But what I really wanted to show you there was the rover shooting some lasers. And that's what I'm going to talk about today mostly. So let's, let's go, as I said, the scientific goals. So I have here the scientific goals uh, of the Mars, uh, the, uh, let me just put my, here we go, sorry. So I have here the scientific goals uh, of the Mars rover. Um, can you see them or do you want me to put the full screen? Yeah, the full screen would be better. Would be better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so what we have here, the goals of curiosity. The goals is first to understand Mars biological potential by searching for features that might record the action of biology, i.e., what are there any biological features on Mars or potential for those? Another goal is to characterize the geology of the planet or at least the area where the rover would be, which is called the Gale Crater. Not everywhere, but around there. And then also understand the processes that might indicate as habitability. Now, what does that mean? That means that, you know, can we see if there, there's a presence of water on Mars, number one, and also if there's enough biochemistry, if there's presence of past biochemistry on Mars. And then the other one is also to characterize the planets. It's a lot of characterization in this mission, to characterize the pressure on Mars, the temperature on Mars, the radiation on Mars, 
But the second part is to understand if there is the potential for habitability, not habitability itself, but the potential for habitability. So, so, so this goal, the goal here, I just want to make it clear, is not to search for life itself on Mars with curiosity, but for environments in which with life could exist. So there's two different things, looking for life and looking for an environment where life could exist are two different things. So this curiosity wasn't to look for life, wasn't, you know, it's not one of the goals, but the goal is mostly to actually see if the environment could have sustained in the past or today uh, uh, an environment that sustains, could sustain life. And for those of you interested, there is an article in Science. There's also an article in uh, Optics Photonics News that actually can describe this in a lot more detail. And clearly when we do this, when we look for an environment that sustains life, water is a major, major component. So you will see, you will hear quite a lot about water when one talks about research on Mars. So to do this, there is a rover. Rover, this one is Curiosity. I will describe it very, very quickly. Uh, again, if you're interested, there's a lot of papers on this, scientific papers. For those of you who are not, do not, are not don't want to read scientific papers or, or that's not your, your, your uh, forte, um, I actually written an article in Lwatan around 2012 that describes almost every single part of this and that was published in Lwatan, so you're interested in this. What I want to say here, the Curiosity rover, what you need to know is that we have a rover here is divided into remote instruments, contact instruments, and in situ instruments. So the remote instruments are instruments that can do measurements at a distance. You don't have to touch the sample. You don't have to bring the sample to the rover or to a lab or anything, just remotely. So you do this uh, from a distance, this measurement from a distance. And the contact instruments are those instruments that need to go to a rock, need to go or touch a sample to do a measurement. And the in situ instruments, you probably read this, saw this, are instruments where the rover would have to dig a little bit or pick up something, bring it into the rover, do some measurements like laser absorption and so forth to, know, to gain some knowledge from it. So in this talk, I'll be focusing clearly on the work that of the instrument I'm part of, and that's the ChemCam instrument you see here at the top. And that is a chemistry camera, and it's a remote camera. So that's the one that is on Curiosity, and that's the one I've been working on, and that's the one that I would be focusing my attention to, because clearly there's a lot here to talk about. On each of these instruments, you could, you could have a course, essentially. So how does the ChemCam -cam camera work? Well, ChemCam -cam is really a laser, an infrared laser, that is pulsed, i.e. it has energy that is uh, quite high, uh, so it's a, it's a pulse laser, so you got the pulse of energy and then nothing, and then a, another pulse of energy, then nothing, and it ra runs at about two hertz, one hertz, two hertz, uh, and, and, and it could go, I think, to five hertz sometimes, but mostly run at two hertz. And in this, 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 uh, this pulse, infrared, is leaves essentially shoots from this spot here and goes to a target that was predefined by taking images, images with these cameras here, by taking images with these cameras and other cameras as well. So we, for example, believe that maybe this rock here or this spot on Mars is interesting to, to look at. So then therefore there's a decision that actually that's the spot we're going to shoot at. So it shoots a laser and when it shoots a laser, then you have, you can take uh, remote micro imaging. So you can, can take some, some images from there as well. You can take them from these two cameras, but also from there. And you can also then, because the laser is powerful, it's been selected for that reason, it's powerful enough to, to have a process, which I'm going to describe to you in a minute, that actually burns a little bit of a hole in there. And as it does, then the light that is formed here gets collected back or gets collected by uh, by telescope here and the telescope then sends the light for analysis 
to, to a spectrophotometer that's built in here. So essentially you have a laser coming out, which you saw in that video, that's how I showed it to you. But then when it hits something, it hits a target, then that target is burnt through a process that I'm going to describe in a minute. And that process gives us light. It doesn't give you three different bunches of lights like this, but it gives you one light that you can then analyze and find out all the different colors or what's called a spectra of the rock. And that allows us to understand the chemistry of that rock or what is it formed, what, what, what's that, what, what forms that rock. So that's really uh, what happens. And here, what you can see is really a picture, right, of prior, this is a picture of a rock, black and white, prior to shooting with a laser and after shooting. You see one, two, three, four, five, and on each of these, there were about probably 30 to 50, I think it's 50 shots on each of these, and it digs a hole a little bit. So that's what the rover does, and that's what the rover collects as data, and that's what we come back to us to analyze. And it can do these things from 1.6 meters away from, from, from the rover to about seven meters. In the new Perseverance, it'd be a little bit longer than that. So what's the process by which this happens? Well, the process, I just described it, right? You've got a laser, shoots a sample. Sounds really simple, right? And there is a plasma that's formed. A plasma meaning there's light that's being formed here because it's burnt. So when you burn something, there's light. And that light is collected by the spectrograph. And essentially, you see the picture here of what happens. So this picture here shows you exactly what happens uh, in terms of what you see. But if you dig a little bit deeper, what you will see, depending if we just take these, these, these two metals, aluminum and copper, you will see if you do this to them, they emit light of different colors. Why? Because the atomic structure of aluminum and copper is different, and therefore the emission that you get from those different materials is going to be different, and the colors is different. And now, if you can dig further and further, really every single element or every single material has its own characteristic color, as provided you can go and dig into it. So then what? Well, then you can, you can do what Newton has shown us to do, which is to take light that comes from this plasma, and you, dis you disperse it. And once you disperse it, you analyze it, and you get what's called a spectrum. A spectrum is, this is wavelength here. So wavelength is essentially a measure of color, if you wish, in simple terms. The wavelength is here. It has been, so blue will be somewhere around here. Red will be somewhere around here. And on the y-axis, you can measure how intense this is. And then we have, we, my group has published this in 2008. You have actually a database that you can tell you, just looking at this and comparing it to the database, there's also a database at NIST, National Institute of Standard Technology in Washington, DC. Uh, there's, there's another one at Harvard. And you can compare what you have here to what, you, what is in the table here. And therefore, you know precisely whether you have potassium, whether you have titanium, whether you have erbium, whether you have whatever you might have. And it's sensitive enough, you can see parts per million and sometimes parts per billion. Now, this is where I'm going to do a little bit of physics, and I'm going to try to get you to understand what is happening. So please try to follow what's happening here, because if you understand this, you will understand the physics behind many missions, whether it's the Curiosity, Perseverance, the European, the Chinese, the Indian. I think everybody's trying to do some of this. So what is the process? The process is you take a sample. Here's a sample. This box is a sample. This sample here, right? This sample here is, uh, could be a rock, could be sand, could be water, could be anything. And you shoot a laser on it, usually infrared. You focus it. This shows that it's focused. And what happens? Well, we know that nature is formed of atoms. We know that. That's the basic, the, the building block of nature. Now, if I put two atoms together, I form molecules. If I put three or four or more, I form molecules. Now, this graph here shows you the distance between two atoms. This is the distance between two. Let's take simple case, two atoms. 
diatomic molecule. So two atoms, here's a distance. This is the distance between them. When they are very close, this is zero, what happens is that you have a positive, the nuclei that push each other away, and the electron and the nuclei try to get together. So that process, that potential as a whole, will give you a, essentially a potential that looks like this. So from far, if you're far away, they don't really, you know, there's no energy. But as you come closer, they will actually get together. So the energy will go down. And as you come even closer, they're going to repulse each other. So therefore, the minimum energy is at the bottom somewhere here. And molecules and electrons will be in these wells here. This is just simple molecular, molecular physics. So, and then what happens in this case, in this, in this experiment that we're doing here, is that if you shine light on it here, the electron that was sitting in this well can now go to a higher well, or even higher, or higher, or higher. That's why you need a lot of energy. And you got to point where the electron is free and it creates an ion. So the electron just disappears, it's gone, it's free, it's an ion. But then also these atoms that were held together through this potential here, now you put them, they, you're taking them away and away. It's a long range distance between them and therefore they become free. You become free atoms. So you have here, they're free. This is an atom. If I had sodium, sodium, this would, sodium, or whatever it might be, this would be a free atom, this would be a free atom because they're too far. So therefore, I, I could have ions, I could have neutrals, I could have molecules, and this happens really fast. It happens in a few hundred femtoseconds, which is 10 to the minus 15 uh, uh, seconds. So it's really a fast process. So we haven't finished. So that's the process I want you to understand is the laser does this. It actually breaks out the molecules, right? And as it breaks them out, then we have ions, we have electrons, we have all of this mesh together. But when it happens, the energy is so high, the temperature of the sample starts to rise. And it rises really high, quite high in a few picoseconds, 10 to the minus 12. So this is very, very fast. And then when you have, let me understand this, let you understand this, you need to take this and understand this. When I have a high temperature, very high, and I have free ions, free electrons, neutrals, that's a plasma. It's like the sun. That's a plasma. So essentially, it will really be almost like a small sun if you want that you've created. That's a plasma. And then what happens? Well, the plasma, the sun that you just created, or the, or the plasma, the microplasma that you just created, to be fair, it's a microplasma is going to interact with the environment that's a lot cooler than it. And therefore, it's going to cool down really fast. But as it cools down, it emits energy, it emits photons, light. And that's the light we collect. Now, all of this is extremely fast. So we shoot and we collect really, really fast. And in fast, meaning a few microseconds, you have signals. So that's why this is, uh, I, I'm going to do this. So the other thing to understand here, the physics to understand here, is there's a dynamic to all of this. All of these things, well, happen really fast, but not at the same time. So you have ions who get emitted first. We have neutrals who take a little bit of time to get to be separated from each other. So this is time here on the x-axis, and this is really, if you want, whatever you want to look at. And what you find is you can look, you can open a window, and look at the ions only, the neutrons only, or the molecules only. Or you can look at the whole thing if you wish. So, so that depends on the timing. When do you want to look? It's like if you have a camera, you're taking a picture. Am I taking a picture when uh, you are sitting like this? Or am I taking a picture a little bit later on? So the timing is very, very important. And, you know... Um, this is, this is really, really gives you, the beauty of this is that you don't have to do anything to the sample. You just shoot. You don't have to clean it. You don't have to take it. You don't have to take it to the lab. You don't have to do anything. You just shoot and get something. Now, we, uh, this, 
this plasma, there's some physics behind it, but we can calculate the temperature that gets in there. We can calculate what's called the density of electrons that, we, that are in there. And those are characteristics of the sample itself. So I know if the temperature is a certain level and, and the electron is a certain level, it is characteristics of, 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 uh, of a material. So all of these things are published. All of these things are, I'm happy to talk with anybody um, further, but I just wanted to give you a brief uh, overlook. So what do we do? So in my group, what we do, we characterize the lasers that we have on Mars. We characterize them. What's, you know, how fast they are, uh, spatial, everything. Then one of the things we do, we do a hydrodynamic simulation. So we do calculations. We calculate, as I just said, the temperature and the density of the electrons of various materials that might be on Mars. And then we compute all of this. And then we also, out of there, we simulate, not simulate, sorry, we predict if we saw such, I'm not a geologist, but if you see some, this type of rock, what would you expect to see mathematically and sort of the physics here? And that we've published, we published in 2018, last year, where we've shown actually that by comparing what we predicted with, and to what we see, there's a good agreement. So we trust, or at least I trust this model here. There's a lot more work to be done, but the model seems to work. So you can predict if somebody says we're seeing this type of rock, again, I'm not a geologist, rock A, and we say, okay, what's in that rock A? What do you think it's in rock A? And they say, we think there's magnesium, there's titanium, and this molecule or that molecule. There's a little bit of glass, maybe a little bit of, maybe a little bit of, um, of sand, SiO2, and so forth. So we put all of that, we calculate, and we say, now, if that's what you're seeing, it's likely this is the spectrum you would see. And so that's the theory behind all of this. And anybody, again, who's interested, the paper is published. And again, there's a lot of work, in my opinion, that can be done along these lines that I know I don't have time to do. And I know, we, we, but there's a lot to be done along those in, in that area. And by the way, that paper that I just said, I just want to say this, was dedicated, you can see it here, was dedicated to the memory of the, the, the people who died on April 11th, 2018 in the plane crash in Boufferic. Uh, southwest of Algeria. So that paper, uh, when we published it, uh, we, we dedicated it to, uh, to, uh, to those Lima to Lair Hamam for plane crash. I like. Anyway, so, so this is what the instrument looks like on Mars. So that's what I just described to you. This is what it is. It's, uh, it's, 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 this is on Mars. It's a, a photograph taken on Mars. Now, I hope you understood at least the basic physics behind what is going on. And, the, and, and what is going on, as I just said, let me just summarize a little bit, is the laser very intense, intense enough. What's very intense mean? It's intense enough to break the molecules of rocks that we're interested in on Mars. And when it does, the rock goes through a process, atomic and molecular process, where it creates this plasma. And that plasma, as it cools, because the environment is colder than it, it cools really fast emits light and that's the light we collect and that's the light that tells us what we are seeing. So the same thing can be happening on earth and the same thing can be happening in any, uh, you know, any environment. Why is this very interesting too? You don't have to be there. People use it. I know some groups use it, for example, in what they call very, very tough environments, whether it's nuclear, whether it's polluted, whether you can go in there. So remotely, from about five to six meters, seven meters, you can do these measurements and get a really good idea of what you're seeing. So, so what you get at the end of the day is what you see here. On the x-axis is wavelengths. Remember, for those of you who are not physicists, wavelengths here is really a measure of the color of the light that you're seeing. In the 200s here, it's, it's, it's in the blue UV area. And in this area on the red 700, 800, it's the, it's the infrared and, 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 and area. And in the middle is the visible, what we see. And what you see here is one of the first measurements we had on Mars. I think it was 13 days after we Mars to landed. I'm not sure how you, you would say it, but anyway, well, after we got to Mars. So, and what you will see is each of these spikes here, each of them, it's like digital you know, it's like what we have in our fingers, fingerprints. Every one of us has its own fingerprints. Well, same thing. Oxygen has its own fingerprints. Hydrogen has its own fingerprints. Sodium has its own fingerprints. Silicon has its own fingerprints because of the way the atoms are formed. And therefore, 
by looking at this, you can find out if you have iron, magnesium, silicon, whatever, titanium. Titanium is there. So we can see it. But also what we saw at that time, that actually there was a hot oxygen and hydrogen. So the question becomes, is that oxygen and hydrogen, the ratio, would that make sense with, with water? So if the, we do some calculations, but is that ratio is exactly what you'd expect for water or is it something else? Is it free oxygen from somewhere else? Was it free ox or hydrogen from somewhere else? So that actually was the first indication that there's possibly, possibly some water. And of course, there are measurements later on with other instruments and everything put together uh, proved that there was some, some, some water. Um, so this is uh, 656. This is, uh, so this is, the, uh, this is one of the work done for, for water. And as I said, there are a lot of data that comes, a lot of information that comes that allowed us to say that there's absolutely every reason to believe or to sh we pr prove that there is actually water on Mars. So that's the first step. Other things is on Earth, I went to Tamanrasset and I've seen this for, for, for Hogarth China. On, uh, you can see in the rocks, you can see things like this. Uh, um, again, not being a geologist, I didn't even know this term before I joined this team. They're called veins, okay? These veins are like this. But on Mars, you see things like this as well, when you take pictures. So on Earth, when you see this, these are indications that the water has flown through here at some point. In fact, it's the same thing when we have things in our kitchens or something where we had tubing and if there's cal cal uh, cal cal calcium deposits, it becomes white. So these are actually calcium deposits over many, many, many years. And these are also, we've seen these on Mars. So therefore, we wanted to shoot in here with a laser to see whether there are also calcium deposits. Because if they are, maybe, maybe and only maybe, it means that water actually flew from here and allowed calcium to settle just like it does on Earth. And sure enough, when you do the measurements, we shot with the laser. It's not easy to shoot that vein that's that small, but you find that the, it is calcium and it is calcium deposits. And that was another indication. You can see it here. I don't know if you can see it very well. You can see the vein here. So the vein here, when you dig, you can see there's a vein here. And this vein here means maybe that water went from the surface to underneath. Because Mars is not like Earth. Earth has, we have all these plat uh, platonic plates and so forth that actually allow things to flow through cracks. Mars doesn't have that. So this is, this is you know, uh, one vein that we saw. And, uh, you know, the idea was to shoot on it. And there was a shot on it and I was near it. And clearly there was calcium deposits, calcium sulfates deposits there. So that was an old indication. So now I'm showing you the results of, of, of the first mission. And I'm looking at my watch too, because I know I've got to run at, at some point. So, um, but, but I would like to also talk to you about what's called calibration targets. Calibration targets are targets, i.e. samples that are taken from Earth on Curiosity to Mars. And why do you do this? Well, you do this because you know these very, very well. They've been made on Earth, right? So that one of them is titanium. I think this is titanium plate, 10. Uh, another one is graphite. It's like, you know, pencil. You know them. There is no need for you to try to guess what they are. You know them. So one of the things we do is we shoot a laser on these calibration targets. They are sitting just on the rover, 1.6 meters away from the laser. And as you shoot, right, then you see whether what the signal you get from this is exactly you, what you would expect. If it is not, what does that mean? Either the laser is not working or there was a deposit on this, maybe dust or something like that, or something went wrong. So these are checks if you want. You check whether things are working. These are calibration targets. So in my group, what we wanted to do, not just to shoot these targets and figure out what they are, we wanted to calculate what the spectrum on Mars we would expect from, from, uh, from, uh, from these targets. With the laser we have, with the Mars environment, which is different from Earth environment and different from the lab, and we calculated them. And this we published as well, 
and we got some really good 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 results both from the simulations and compared to the to, to the labs um, so that's uh, something that is out there now we took that further and we started to look after a few days when the rover keeps moving right and do these calculations and what it allows us to do well first of all look at this picture here the plasma we see on earth this is in los alamos where my you know uh, uh, roger vince is the is the pi he, he's the one leading this and this is on mars and this is if you were on the moon so the pressure and the temperature of the environment affects the plasma that's that's formed so here on this graph here on the top what you will see is what we have calculated and we expect and sometimes we see things that are unknown like this one unknown here uh, or this two molecular bands these are unknown and when we see that what does that mean either something is wrong with the laser or something has happened to the target and in this case is deposits in this case it was lithium i believe uh, somehow lithium just dust or something left some lithium behind and there was a, sh a little bit of, of, of that uh, sitting there so but what does it also allow us to do as you might imagine it's quite difficult if not impossible it's only difficult on earth to measure how much energy laser energy you are putting in a spot um, per unit area okay because the spot is so small it's quite difficult to measure it and the energy there is very difficult. So anything you put in there that you want to measure that energy there gets burnt. There's too much energy and the spot is very small. So almost all the detectors will not work. So how do you do this? There's ways to do it. But one way we do it, at least again from the paper I just showed you that was dedicated to people from the Metofi Bufek Hamom, what we've said is, well, what we will do is we measure ratio of elements, what we see, and provided it is within a range that we have, the, the, the Mars rover was, 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 was designed for, and provided we remain in that range, things are okay. If we go outside of the range, like here or here, then there's a problem. So it's another check that actually allows, you to, allows us to decide whether there's something not quite right. Now, I'm going to stop here for today. Next time I'll talk about perseverance and move to, 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 to analysis of data. So let me just say what I wanted to do today. Today I want, let me just summarize a little bit. I wanted to give you, for you to understand the scientific goals of both the Mars 211, the Curiosity mission, and the Perseverance mission. Two, I wanted you to understand one fundamental concept, that the laser spectroscopy concept, about what happens when you shoot a laser, an intense laser on these rocks, because this is a technique that's being used, one of the techniques, not the only technique, that's being used on Mars. It's also one of the techniques that's going to be used in many Mars missions uh, to come. So I wanted you to understand that. And that technique is called laser, because it's a laser, breakdown, uh, sorry, laser induced. So the laser induces a breakdown because it breaks the, the, the atom, so the molecule, sorry spectroscopy spectroscopy because it give you it give you essentially fingerprints atomic and molecular fingerprints so i wanted you to understand that i also wanted you to understand this power in doing theory and this power in doing measurements and it's the combination of the two that in my opinion is really the strength that you know we we, we could have and then i presented to you some results very briefly what i've shown you that actually when we look for water, which is a key criterion, there is a way you can do it. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a way you can do it. And we, I've shown you a little bit of the spectra. I know it was really fast. That shows you that the hydrogen, when you see hydrogen, when you see oxygen, then you do some work and you find out whether those ratios really match those of, of water. And also there's other measurements from x-rays and from this and from that that come together and do all of this. That's what I wanted to do today. Next time we talk a little bit more about data and information and, and, and all of that stuff and what we do with the data when it comes from, from Mars. And we'll talk also about perseverance, which is going in a in, in few days. So thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. And I'll said I will have to jump off at four o'clock. 
So, uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Professor Nor Dimlich. It was uh, it was very informative. I really learned about more about. Uh, I have now a clear idea about laser and the the works that uh, have been done on Mars uh, on the Curiosity mission. So I have a little question for you before you go to to another meeting. So what? Uh, uh, just a general question. What's the easiest way to go around Mars? I, I can I can hear. You. Say that again. What is what is the easiest way to go around Mars? Mm, I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> the easiest way to go around Mars, wow. <laughs> I mean, stay on Earth, you're going around Mars, so I'm not exactly sure. Do you mean rotate around it, or do you mean... Uh... Yeah, uh, I, I mean the uh, the rovers, the Curiosity rovers. Uh, what's, what was the easiest oh, way oh, to go oh, around Oh, 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 I see, I see. For Curiosity rover, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not easy. Nothing is easy. So, so for Curiosity rover to move on Mars, you need uh, a lot of energy and you need a lot of planning because Mars is a rush environment. It's a very, very tough environment. So, so, the, so, so you have a lot of, the, there's a, the orbiter there that looks on Earth and see what the, the environment looks like. But just to give you an idea, we've been there since 2012. Now it's 2020, right? So it's about eight years, a little bit less than eight years, seven and something. Well, we've, we've moved about, well, 20 to 30 kilometers because it's extremely difficult to move. It's, it requires energy. And also, if you move, you need to have a reason to move and you need to know where you move. And that's why the technique I just described to you is so interesting because you don't have to move. You can shoot six, seven meters away and you're fine. But the other contact ones is difficult because you have to get to really close to the sample that you are interested in. And, and, and that's not always easy. And then you have difficulty due to safety. You don't want to lose the, ro the, the rover, you know, going to... Uh, the sub remove or, or something like that. So all of that, all of this is, 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 is something taken into account by engineers and see how we move and, and where we can move and so forth. And we have some of these margin dust winds as well. So there's a lot of dust that comes from time to time and the rover has to cover itself and, and make sure that all the instruments will still be working after that, 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 that uh, major, major thing. So it's not easy uh, and uh, it's not easy at all. And this, the fact that it's not easy shows you why it is so important, I didn't talk about this, to land in a spot of interest. If yeah. you land far, okay, from, the, land, from the, the spot of interest where you think there is some science to do, then you have to move quite a lot. So same thing if I ask you, we're going to look for life in Algeria or water in Algeria. Well, if you go to Naba, right? Yeah. Or yeah, you yeah. go to the desert in El Wed, it's not the same. So the chances are is go to Aneba and look for water there. But yeah. if you somehow land in El Wed, it's going to take you a while to find water in the desert. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Yeah, good, good. Uh, I think, uh, uh, are, you, are you in for a, a second yeah. question or? Yeah, yes. okay. So uh, I just have to land the uh, second question for Mehdi or Paris or Mr. Benfat to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question would be about the perseverance mission. It's about that uh, helicopter. Is it going to take measurements from the air, or will it uh, just take pictures? What is the purpose of the? Yeah, that that I'm going to talk about next time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Just to, to say to our public that we are going to talk next time with the professional Dominican on 22nd of July about mm -hmm. uh, the Perseverance mission. Uh, and uh, we are going to learn more about planet Earth, Mars and the experience that uh, all the scientists and all the globe are united to, to do those uh, experience on Mars. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, if you want another question, I can check. Yeah, I have another question from I the have public. Five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what did Four the study? Oh, yeah, uh, what did the study of rock composition teach us till now? So, so it, it taught us quite a lot. Uh, so, it, first of all, we understand Mars a lot better than we did before. Uh, but what it really has taught us is actually, you know, the things that we we're looking for, which is, is there possibility of having water on Mars? And the answer is yes. The question that remains now is where did that water go? 
I have a video that I, I don't have to show you, but you know, so you can imagine what Mars was like 3.5 billion years ago, right? Mars was at that time, like our planet, a lot of water, rivers, beds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But where did that water go is the big question. And uh, you know, is there is there life with this water that went under under the surface and so forth? So we learned about that. So we learned quite a lot about the composition of rocks on, on Mars. We learned about the diversity of the rocks that exist on Mars, or at least at the Gale Crater, i.e. the area where we landed, because now we're going to Jerusalem or somewhere else. So, so you know, it's, ex it's the same thing. If you go and, and see the rocks that exist in Palestro, uh, in my region, Thniora, it's not the same rocks that might exist in, 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 in Ghana or somewhere else, right? So, mm -hmm. so it depends. So in that region, we've learned at least about the Gale Crater, quite a lot about rocks. And again, I'm not a geologist, but those of you who are interested in ge geology, uh, you can find a lot of papers about, you know, the, the, type of, uh, the type of rocks that are around and in the Gale Crater. And I invite you to go and look at those papers. Um, you, there's, there's a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Professor Lord Dirmilich, for, for answering our question. Uh, I think you have to go now. For yep. the, and I'll appreciate yeah. it if you think the physics yep. that I've explained, you yeah. got it, I'll be really, really happy. If not, because I think it's important concepts to understand, mm -hmm. because you learn there's a lot of Mars missions that are coming, yeah. you understand that. Uh, if you do, um, um, fine, and if not, I'll be happy to send people some basic papers to, to read if they wish to. But the two papers I've shown, one in uh, Zapping, Zapping Mars with Lasers, it's mm -hmm. in Optics and Photonics News 2012, I believe. That is relatively simple, accessible to the public. Yeah, great. We are going to share uh, every reference you mentioned in the presentation. Uh, so now, thank you very much, Professor Menor de Thank hope you. To see you. Hope to see you soon in our next presentation uh, today and uh, after uh, after today. Yeah. Okay. We will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Take care. Uh, yeah. Thank take you. care. Thank uh, you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bark long fi kum liyom ala ala mushahad liyom tal. Yeah. Uh, بارك الله فيكم اليوم uh, كان معنا البروفيسور نور الدين مليكشي uh, hope you uh, you learned as much as you as you can from this presentation and uh, hope to see you soon in next episode yes uh, tomorrow we will be having uh, an episode uh, talking about business opportunities uh, in launching human and vehicles uh, in space with uh, Ms. Thorsten uh, Wallet uh, the, the global vice president of uh, SAP division aerospace and defense uh, and air transportation. So uh, make sure to, to set a reminder. Uh, same time, uh, same place, uh, Rocket Rebellion team. And uh, see you next time.